Good morning, everyone. We can make our way to find our seats. All right. If you can make your way to find your seats, we will begin here in just a moment. I'd like to welcome everybody to Bethany Baptist Church in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's great to be with you all this morning and to be with the house of God, uh, which is not a building, but a people. Uh, I want to welcome you if you're a visitor here this morning and uh, just make you aware of a few things. There is a visitor card in the pew back nearby. If you'd like to fill that out and drop it in the offering box, please feel free to do so. Uh, The offering box is located on the back wall uh, in this room here. Uh, If you have any questions in regards to the Christian faith, in regards to the Bible, uh, please feel free to reach out and uh, seek the help of a pastor or a member. We'd love to field any of those questions that you have. If you have any questions about membership or about uh, this um, congregation as a whole, uh, please feel free to reach out and ask any questions. Our regular meeting times, we meet here at 10.30 a.m. Uh, for morning worship. We also have our midweek prayer meeting, which is Thursday evenings at 6.30 p.m. And uh, we also have an afternoon service, which is the first and third Sundays of the month. And uh, we have a bring your own lunch. And then the last, the fourth Sunday, we have a potluck. And if you have any questions, uh, do ask about those as well. With the uh, announcements aside, I'm going to go ahead and just open our time together as we come together to worship the true and the living God. Uh, for a portion of uh, a passage from Psalm 96:10, before we sing together our first hymn. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Amen. Let us uh, sing together to our God and uh, remember our, our holy God at this time, singing together from the Trinity hymnal, hymn number 87. Trin- num- uh, Trinity hymnal number 87, please rise together and let, let us sing to our great God.
you will, please join me as we continue in our scripture reading. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 6 this morning. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 6. And we pick up in this narrative in 1 Samuel, remembering some things that have gone ahead that uh, in Israel's disobedience and in them going before the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Uh, We saw that the Lord afflicted the Philistines Uh, because of their dealings with the ark and uh, ultimately the Philistines relent and they return the ark to Israel. As we consider this narrative uh, this morning and as we continue to meditate on these things and the journey of the ark amongst Israel and the Philistines, we are reminded, no doubt, that God is holy. The Lord has directed his people pertaining to the ark uh, and to ignore God's word is to expose themselves to danger. And sometimes we look upon passages and we see God acting in divine justice uh, when people disobey his word. And it can be shocking to us, shocking to our senses. And uh, it should be shocking, uh, rightfully so. Because that is when we come face to face with what it is for uh, an unholy people uh, to face a holy God. And uh, that has great repercussions. And that gives us all the more reason uh, to remember the joys that we have uh, in the one who has come that can mediate between uh, our maker and us. That can bring us before a holy God and make us holy. Let's remember these things as we read this passage this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty. But by all means, return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. When they said, what is the trespass offering which we should return to him? They answered, five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods, and from your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened theirs when he did mighty things among them? Did they not let the people go that they might depart? Now, therefore, make a new cart, take two milk cows, which have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart, and take their calves home, away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and set it on the cart, and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go. And watch, if it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil." But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. Then the men did so. They took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went. And it did not turn aside to the right hand or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. 
So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, and one for Eshkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the number of the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel, on which they set the ark of the Lord, which remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,000 and 70 men of the people, and the people lamented, because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy God? And to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Amen. Let's take this time to go before our God and pray to our Maker and remember our holy God together as a people. Let's pray. Father, we confess before you today that you are the God, the only God, that is holy, holy, holy. Lord, you are set apart. You are unlike any other. Lord, you even are far beyond what we can comprehend. Lord, we know from your holy word and through the work of your spirit, Lord, that you are without sin. Lord, that you are perfectly pure. That there is no impurity in you. And Lord, we confess these high things to you today. Lord, believing them, hoping them. But Lord, at the same time, knowing the struggle within our own hearts and minds, knowing we want these very truths to sink even deeper into us. Lord, we confess as a people, Lord, that we are not holy. And Lord, that is very evident to us in our daily walk. Lord, if if you have brought us from death to life, uh, which you have for many of us, Lord, we are met face to face with that brutal reality on a daily basis. And we even know that we are those who are not only prone to wander from you and your goodness, But Lord, we are those who are even prone to indict you, our very holy maker. Lord, we know that we sometimes stand in opposition to your word and and think ourselves wise enough to question you in your holy ways. Lord, we confess these things before you. Entrusting ourselves to you, hoping, Lord, because you are the only one that can continually renew our minds and strengthen us. Lord, you are the only one that can remove all of these doubts in you. You are the only one uh, in which we can hope for better things, uh, for greater faith and greater hope in the living and the true God. Lord, we know that we sin daily, that we fail in our love towards you, And we fail in our love towards our neighbors. Lord, it is painfully evident in our lives. And Lord, we again confess these things to you. Lord, knowing that if we are, if we trust in you and abide in you and confess these very things, Lord, we know that you will be faithful to cleanse us of these things. Lord, that you will continue to make us by degree, by degree, holier and holier like you. 
And Lord, we look forward to these things and we look to you alone for these things. Lord, we thank you this morning that we have a true and abiding fellowship with you. Lord, that we have a fellowship that can never be broken. Lord, that we have a fellowship that no man on earth can take from us. Lord, we could be afflicted um, emotionally, physically, to the greatest of depths, Lord, that can be known by man. And Lord, we, you will never depart from us. We will always have you, our sovereign, by our side. Lord, we thank you that these things are true in the gospel. Lord, we thank you for these very gospel truths that we stand on this day. Lord, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the, your faithfulness, for your willingness to lay down your life, that these things might be true of us, that we might be able to confess these things as a people, perfect as we are, but we can confess, Lord, your perfectness, your willingness to uh, fulfill all things on our behalf, your, your perfect life, perfect love towards God, perfect love towards man. Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work uh, in our lives to reveal the truths of these things to us. Holy Spirit, we thank you for opening our eyes, raising us from death to life, being able to see and believe these things. Lord, pulling back the scales, Lord, that we might have eyes to see, that we might have ears to hear, that our stony hearts would be made soft, that we might be able to receive the truth of the gospel and the love of God. Lord, we pray this morning that you would continue to humble us, Lord, that you would make us a people that are wholly dependent upon you, Lord, that you would use this time, these prayers, that you would use uh, this singing as we sing not only to you, but as we proclaim the truths uh, found that we believe and know from Scripture to one another, as we come before your word and meditate upon it, as the pastor preaches it and expounds it, we pray, Lord, that you would use your very word, the word of life, to have its way in us and in this congregation. Lord, we pray that this would spread from our congregation to others. Lord, others in our families, others in our communities, others in our state, and others to the end of the world. Lord, we pray that you would use even this day, uh, this sermon, this time, Lord, to have eternal impact upon lives, uh, upon minds, upon hearts. Lord, we pray that you would work and we ask because we know we are wholly dependent upon you. We know that we are weak and frail. We know that we have no ability in, our, in and of ourselves to execute these things. That we are dependent upon you and you alone. Lord, we pray that your will would be done in our midst. And we pray these things through Christ. Amen. Let us uh, sing together. Uh, as we have meditated upon God's word, as we have sung already, let us continue to do so, engaging our hearts and our mind in our worship. And please open your uh, bulletin. Uh, you have an insert in there. Uh, it is our song, All I Have is Christ. Please stand together as we sing of the great truth, the great gospel truth that we have in clinging to our one and only Savior together.
going to have our second time of corporate prayer before our final hymn. Let us take up the needs of our uh, little ones amongst us, the children of um, the members of Bethany Baptist Church. Let us pray that the Lord might work in their hearts and minds to bring them uh, from darkness to light. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful truths that we can sing and proclaim. We thank you for the truth that all we have is Christ. We thank you that that is enough for us. We thank you that you have purposed and designed that the whole of the universe could confess these things, knowing that Christ is enough. And we pray, Lord, that as we, your people, proclaim these things and, and revel in them, we pray, Lord, that our little ones would do the same. Lord, we pray that you would work in the hearts and minds of our children uh, to bring them, Lord, out of darkness. Lord, we pray that they would be convicted of their sin, even at a young age. Uh, we pray, Lord, that they would know their desperate need of salvation through Christ. And we pray, Lord, that they would turn to Christ. Lord, that they would repent and believe. Lord, that they would find the hope that we have in Christ. We pray, Lord, that our joy would be made complete and our little ones coming to know the wonderful hope and the grace found in the truth of the gospel. Uh, Lord, we know that these things are not automatic for man. We know that these things uh, are even impossible for man by nature. Uh, we know that we are dependent upon you for doing something that is impossible for us to do on our own, for a work of the Spirit to regenerate hearts and minds. But Lord, we uh, look to you for these very things. Lord, praying that you would make your glory to be known in their lives. Lord, that you would be magnified. And we pray, Lord, for your will to be done in all these things. In Christ's name, amen. Let us unite our hearts and sing our third and final hymn, hymn number 281 in the Trinity hymnal. Let us rise together and sing one last time.
Good morning, everybody. It's good to be gathered with you this Lord's Day, especially as we have gathered to witness the baptism of our brother Joel Dimite. And we want to extend a very warm welcome to all of our visitors and our friends who are with us today and hope that you are all edified and you find and place your hope and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and the saving merits of His blood. And so let's, uh, in that vein, turn to God's Word this morning to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, let's read together verses 1 through 5. Romans 6, 1 through 5. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. Amen. Let's unite our hearts and pray as we come to consider God's Word together. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, what a joy it is to gather together into the worship of the true and the living God, to come together as a people who are redeemed of the Lord. Father, our hearts, as we think about the glories of heaven, as we think about the glories of the inheritance that has been laid up for us and prepared for us by Christ Himself, Lord, our hearts sail as we think of Your kindness and Your condescension and Your mercy to sinners. We are utterly undeserving. We are sinful in and of of ourselves. All of us are rebels by nature against Your Word and against Your holiness and Your goodness. But in Your great and eternal love, You sought us before we sought You. Father, You set Your love upon us from before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in Christ such that You sent Christ in the fullness of time to do what the law could not do. You sent Your Son in the likeness of sinful flesh that through His death and His becoming a curse for us, You condemned our sin in the body of our Lord Jesus so that we in Him may become the righteousness of God. Father, we thank You for the gift of Your Holy Spirit whom You have given to dwell within us. The One who seals us until the day of redemption. The One who opened our eyes to see the beauties of Christ, the beauties of His Gospel, to teach us true wisdom and to turn us away from the foolishness of the world and our own worldly thinking. He taught us to treasure Christ, to cling to Christ, to rejoice that we have Christ, and that though He may be all we have, that He is enough for us. Father, draw out our hearts this morning, we pray, as we consider baptism, as we consider the glories of the Gospel afresh. Father, work within our hearts, not just our understanding. We pray that we would grow in our understanding, but also in the affections of our heart. That we would grow in love for our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Bless us, we pray. Send Your Spirit to teach us. May this be a day of great encouragement for all of us. 
We pray for your presence to be with us, to draw near to us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the ordinance of baptism is obviously something that's held very dear to Baptists, um, as it is to many others in different traditions of the Christian faith. But sometimes one of the uh, shortcomings of different denominations, if you will, of Christianity is that we have made our camps about what we believe baptism is not such that we focus more on the negative aspects of what we deny than we do on the positive aspects of what baptism is. Uh, For instance, as Baptists, we have strong convictions on who should not be baptized. Uh, We have convictions about what baptism does not accomplish. And while denials have their place in the Christian faith, we also need to be careful that we don't fail to emphasize and to proclaim also the beauties of what baptism is. That's what I want to do this morning is open up just a couple of things regarding baptism. And we can't speak of everything. The Bible has much to say about it. But I want to focus on two primary things. Number one, what does baptism represent? Or to put it another way, why has the Lord Jesus commanded that immersion into water be the sign that the church should practice throughout uh, the church age until His return? What does baptism represent? And secondly, more of an ecclesiastical question, why has Jesus commanded His church to do this? Okay, so what does it represent and why has Jesus commanded us to do this? And the answer to both of those questions, when we as Christians understand them, gives deep significance to what we are going to witness this morning. For the individual being baptized, it is their public identification with Christ, proclaiming publicly their participation in the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ Himself. And for the church at large, it is us testifying to that individual as we allow them entrance into the waters of baptism that this is one who belongs to the Lord Jesus. This is one who is worthy to receive the sign of belonging to Christ. That's why baptisms are such a joy to witness. Not not only as a pastor, but for every member of a church. It's a joy to see those who are identifying with Christ publicly in the waters of baptism. Joel, I'm only going to name you a couple of times in this sermon, so don't don't worry. This whole thing is not going to be about you. But Joel, I know that it's been, in, in in many regards, a long time coming for this in terms of our discussions and wrestlings. And I trust that today, even in anticipation now, that today is a joyous occasion for you, that this will be a great Ebenezer in your Christian life that you will look back upon as a great day of great great importance in your Christian life. Uh, Joel knows, as we all know, that these waters do not inherently in themselves save It is Christ who saves us, and yet the day of our baptism is a significant event for every believer. And Bethany, I trust that this also will be a a great occasion and a great day of joy for all of us as we get to be onlookers and reminded ourselves of God's graciousness towards us that He pours out continually upon sinners. And so let's, let's consider our two questions as we prepare uh, to witness our brother be baptized. Number one, what does baptism represent? This is where I want to focus in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. What does baptism represent? What are we seeing when we witness a Christian baptism? And to put it succinctly and simply, what we are seeing is an outward picture of an inward spiritual reality that has taken place in the believer's heart. As I've already mentioned, there's nothing inherently salvific in the waters of baptism. Uh, Without faith, Hebrews tells us, it is impossible to please God. And yet we know sadly that there are many people who do think that way 
They think that such external surface level remedies are enough to solve the problem and adequately deal with the problem of the human heart. But the Bible makes very clear that our problem as sinners, born as the children of Adam, our problem goes far deeper than any physical water can wash away. But rather, the problem of sin is something deep within us that has infected our hearts and our minds and our wills. And it is something that can be washed away by nothing short of the blood of Christ itself. And it's that internal work of the grace of God, God graciously uniting us to Christ, taking away our sins, it's that internal work that Paul speaks of here in Romans chapter 6. This concept that he summarizes as union with Christ. We see that language very clearly, for instance, in verse 5. Paul says, for if we have been united with Christ in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. You you might know already that Paul's favorite phrase that he uses to describe the Christian's relationship to Christ is to say that we are in Christ. Three times in verses 3 and 4 here, Paul uses that phrase the language of us being baptized into Christ. And there's a connection. There's debates. You read different commentators. There's debates on is Paul really thinking primarily here of water baptism or of spiritual baptism? And and I think honestly, regardless of where, where you fall out on that, there's still undeniably a connection between the two types of baptism. Of this internal baptism that the Holy Spirit does to the believer. Uh, John the Baptist said of himself and and, and, um, comparing himself to Christ's ministry, he said, I baptize you with water, but the one who is coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That is the primary baptism I think Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 6 here. But there's also a connection of the symbolisms then of what water baptism is speaking to. Uh, The word to baptize is just a word that's carried straight over from the Greek, by the way, means simply put to immerse something. Uh, It means to dip. Uh, In in ancient Greek writings, when a ship would sink, they used the word baptism to describe what had happened to the ship. And What Paul is saying here in verse 3 is that all who have been saved have been immersed into Christ. It might actually very legitimately be translated that way instead of baptized. That we've been immersed into Christ. We've been submerged into Christ. And thus, we have been put into Christ. Now, that might sound somewhat strange to us. Um, It's somewhat of a strange preposition to say that we are in Christ. We know what it means to be around people. We know what it means to be with people. But what does it mean to say that we are now in Christ? And this is the heart of the Christian Gospel. This is the heart of the good news of the Gospel. The Gospel, the good news of the Gospel is Christ Himself. Not that just that sinners get benefits, but that we get the person in whom all of the benefits come to us. And I think the best analogy to use to explain this idea of union with Christ is the one that God uses in Scripture itself, the analogy of marriage. For, uh, for instance, Romans chapter 7 and Ephesians chapter 5 are two primary places where Paul uses this analogy. The believer's relationship to Christ is that of a most blessed marriage. You think about marriage from a human perspective, which we know Paul says human marriage is a type of Christ and His church. Human marriage is when a man 
and a woman stand in the presence of God and before the presence of witnesses, and they declare and covenant to one another that whatever comes in sickness or in health, for better or for worse, they are covenanting together with one another for the glory of God. And in that moment, for the wife, as they say, I do, whatever things that she brings into the marriage, whether they be good things, whether they be bad things, once they say, I do, those things become the husband's and vice versa. And the wedding between Christ and the sinner is not like an earthly wedding where both parties bring something good and some things bad, but rather this marriage is where the King of Heaven, the King of all blessedness, blessedness full of all goodness, unites and covenants Himself to the wayward sinner. Where Christ, the lovely bridegroom, perfect in all His ways, takes the sinner to Himself to be His, and in so doing, Christ takes to Himself all that was ours. He takes from us our sins and our death and our unrighteousness, our damnation, He takes that to Himself and in exchange, He gives to us most unworthily and undeservingly, He gives to us all that is in Him. All of His righteousness. All of His grace and His truth. That is what it means to be found in Christ. It's to be engulfed by Christ by all of His blessedness. But we can't properly appreciate the glories of this new marriage unless it's understood against the backdrop of another marriage. And this is one that Paul spent the entirety of Romans chapter 5 opening up. So we're in Romans 6, chapter 5, just the chapter before. Virtu almost all of chapter 5 is a lengthy exposition of Paul opening up our natural union and our most unfortunate marriage, you might say, to our first parent, Adam. Every person in this room, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, doesn't matter how old or young you are, all of us came into this world in a most unfortunate marriage to Adam. In Paul's theology, there, there are two, two he, uh, people who stand unique in human history. Adam and Christ. And the reason those two are significant in Paul's theology is because those two men uniquely stand as the heads of humanity. Adam was the head of the, of the old humanity, his physical posterity, and Christ stands as the head of the new humanity. And when Adam was created by God and placed in the garden, Adam didn't just live there and stand there for his own sake, but rather he stood as a representative of all of his posterity. And in Adam would be found, whether he would obey or disobey, in Adam would be found the fate of the whole human race. If Adam had obeyed his father in the garden, if he had pleased God and obeyed God, we would have all been born into this world into a most blessed experience. We wouldn't be here witnessing baptism. We wouldn't be here sitting under the means of grace of the preaching of the Gospel because there would be no need for it. But what Adam did, and you and I in him as he represented us, was he rebelled against God. He disobeyed the word of his good Creator. And thus, he plunged himself 
And not only himself, but all of his children, every single one of us, into a natural state of enmity with God and death and sin. And we are now by nature born under a curse. Under the curse of God, we are born as those who are children of wrath and condemned by God because we, not only in Adam, but we ourselves have gone the way of Adam and have disobeyed God. But thank God He's given us a second Adam. He's given us a Redeemer. Christ who comes now in the likeness of the first Adam. He comes, God being made flesh, and He stands in a similarly representative place. But Christ now brings an entirely different result to us. If you look at chapter 5 of Romans, verse 18, Paul says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, he's talking about Adam's sin in the garden there, he says, Just as one trespass led to the condemnation of all men, so one act of righteousness, referring to Christ's work, leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And Christian, unbeliever, it is the backdrop of our union with Adam and that, that, the darkness of that union which causes this new marriage to Christ to shine all the more brightly. And that is the the blessed union to which baptism speaks. When we watch our brother go under this water and come out, resurrecting out of these waters that signify of burial and newness of life, it's not just some uh, ritual we're going through, but rather we are seeing depicted before our very eyes redemption from Adam. Redemption from sin and death. That's why Paul describes this in, in the language of death and resurrection in, uh, in verse 3 here. Do you not know that if we've been united and baptized into Christ's death, we will, we will also be raised by the glory of the Father in newness of life? Baptism declares first of all, that the believer has died. That he, he has died to his old self. He has died. There's been a, a, a um, separation now between his union to Adam. Because when Christ died in our place upon the cross of Calvary, as He bore the curse that Adam had brought upon us, Christ, as He died, severed His people from that marriage to marry us to Himself. The guilt of our sin was imputed by the Father to Christ. And death and sin was defeated. And baptism declares, secondly, not only a death to who we once were, but baptism declares, secondly, that we have now risen to newness of life. that that relationship with Adam has been severed and that we now have begun a new relationship with Christ Himself. Our new Head who gives and provides to all of His people grace, newness of life. By means of our union with Christ, we are now alive in Him, our living Head who like the vine supplies the sap of spiritual life and vigor to the hearts of every believer. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, if there's one thing you should walk away from, uh, walk away with this morning, it's this. 
the Christian faith uniquely, contrary to every other man-made religion and every other human-made effort towards getting ourselves to be good enough to be accepted by God, the Christian faith uniquely proclaims a salvation that is rooted completely in the merits of another. It proclaims a message of deliverance and salvation that is rooted not internally of what we have done, but rather rooted in what God Himself has done for us. We do not look as Christians inward to ourselves as the grounds of our reconciliation with God. We, we, we dare not look at the things we have done as though we have anything to present ourselves as acceptable to God, but rather we look solely to Christ our head. We look to Him who in His condescending grace took us to be His very undeserving bride. We look to Christ who comes to the, the, the sinner who is like a beggar. And we look to Him who provides everything that we need for spiritual life and eternal life with God. Just as Joel this morning is not going to baptize himself, but is going to be baptized by another, so it is a picture that our salvation is from first, of la- uh, from first to last something that God does to us and in us by His grace. I want to mention just two things before we move on to the second more brief question this morning. Just briefly, as, as we prepare, as we witness our brother step into the waters of baptism, Two things primarily that it means for us to participate in Christ's death and resurrection. Two things that the waters of baptism depict for us regarding the destruction of sin's curse and power over the sinner. Number one, when Paul speaks of us being baptized into Christ's death and His resurrection, he is speaking of the fact that in terms of our legal standing before God, we have gone from a state of condemnation and guilt to a state of justification and righteousness in the sight of God. This is the courtroom aspect of sin, if you will. What we call justification. When Christ hung upon the cross of Calvary, and He hung in our place our legal debt, the debt that we owed to God for our sins was laid upon Christ. Right? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that He who knew no sin became sin in our behalf so that we might in Him become the righteousness of God. That doesn't mean that Christ suddenly became sinful, but rather He was reckoned in our place as the one who legally bears the punishment of sin. And as Christ undergoes the death that I deserve, dying in my place, my sins were counted and credited to His account so that they are taken from me so that I am now in Christ considered righteous in the sight of God. Worthy to be an heir of all the promises and blessings of eternal life. That's the first aspect of what we're seeing. Is the legal aspect of the transfer. My guilt turns now to righteousness. But the second aspect is this. Not only does union with Christ make us legally acceptable in the sight of God, but it also broke sin's actual power over us. This is actually Paul's main emphasis in Romans 6. There's a transition in the book of Romans where the first few chapters deal mostly with the topic of justification and he uh, transitions, if you will, in chapter 6 to thinking more now about the implications of Christ's death and resurrection for us, not just positionally, but actually. 
Christ's death, Christian. Joel, I know this is a great encouragement or has been to you. Christ's death once for all broke, uh, broke us free from sin's slavery. We who were once bound in sin, powerless and unable to please God, Christ has come by His Spirit and we've died to the slave, our slavery to sin and we've been raised so that we walk following now a new Master. Verses 10 and 11 of chapter 6, Paul says, For the death Christ died, He died to sin once for all, and the life He lives, He lives to God. So therefore, Paul says, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a glorious truth that Christian needs to meditate on. That we look to Christ not only for our justification in the past, but our present sanctification and power that sin will no longer have dominion over us in Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is something of what we're witnessing in the waters of baptism. The Christian's union with Christ as we are submerged under Water, picturing our drowning to our old connection to Adam and coming out raising, being raised to newness of life so that we might now live to a new master. That brings us to the second question this, this morning, more briefly. Why has Jesus commanded His church to do this? Why has Jesus commanded His church to do this? It's one thing for us to understand the imagery of what baptism depicts. But even though that imagery may may have beauty in it, it naturally, naturally leads to the question, though, is there a purpose that baptism serves? Is there something happening in baptism more than simply us putting on display a picture of the Gospel and what has happened to us. And the answer to that is that Jesus has given His church the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. He's given them to His church as the boundary markers which mark His people off from the world. Baptism functions as... Many many Christians don't think about the ordinances this way necessarily. I think that's an area we need to gain more strength in our day in terms of our view of the ordinances. But baptism functions ecclesiastically as a statement on heaven's behalf that this is an individual we, we recognize as one who is following Christ. As I said, many many today have too narrow of an understanding of what's happening when we celebrate baptism in the Lord's Supper. And they're often viewed merely as individual things that the individual does in obedience to God. But the ordinances, including baptism, are bigger than any one uh, individual. Rather, they are Christ's appointed boundary markers by which the church marks off on earth who belongs to the kingdom of heaven. The Lord's Supper, we emphasize often, is the ongoing affirmation of that membership. And baptism is the right of entry into that covenant relationship. I want to turn your attention to one text to see this. Matthew 28. If you would turn there, transition from Romans 6 to the very end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. Matthew 28, most of us are familiar with this passage. Um, Right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Christ has died. He has risen. He's about to ascend back into heaven and enter His glory. And before He returns back to heaven, He's now giving His church on earth 
her mission. And at this point, the church on earth consisted primarily of the 11 apostles. The church was very small at this point in time. But before he ascends into heaven, he gives the church her charter, what she is primarily tasked to do. Jump in at verse 16 of Matthew 28. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Now Christian, let's just pause there for a moment. There's a reason Jesus starts off with that declaration. There's a reason He prefaces our mission with a statement of His own authority. Because that is the great foundation of the church's charter. That our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the One that is our new Master and Head and Husband, is the King of heaven and earth. He is the One who has all authority. And He wants us to know that though He is departing to go into heaven, that He will be with us by His Spirit even to the end of the age to see to it that we are empowered to complete the mission He has given us to. Or given us to do. And that mission is to to use His church as the very means of gathering in His bride that He has purchased. And that's what he commands them in verse 19. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So there's a a shift going on here. Contrary to Israel of old, that was a local people that stayed together, and if you wanted to join Israel, you came to them. Christ is saying, Now my church, the new Israel, is being sent out into every nation to make disciples. And this is very similar to what Jesus said uh, in chapter... uh, Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Chapter 16, sorry. Chapter 16 in Matthew's Gospel, when after Peter made the great confession, Jesus told Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And one of the things that's often uh, missed in that analogy Jesus gives is that gates are not uh, offensive weapons, they're defensive. And what Jesus is saying is that My people are going to take My Gospel into the kingdom of darkness, and though the gates of hell seek to fight against it, yet such is my power and authority that my Gospel will not fail to break through the gates of hell and to gather to Myself all of My people whom I have redeemed. And that's what Jesus is essentially saying here in verse 19 of chapter 28. All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And notice, what does He say we are to do when we make disciples? When the Gospel is preached or shared and someone says, I believe in Christ. The Spirit has opened my eyes to see that this is the Savior of the world and I want to follow Him. How does the church then mark them off from the world and show that they belong now to Christ and as members of His church? Jesus says, verse 19, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptizing them. Marking them off as belonging to the true God visibly and publicly, like our brother Joel is doing this morning, the church is publicly recognizing those who enter the waters of baptism that these are those who are citizens of heaven upon earth. And that means there's two aspects of what we're going to witness in just a moment. There is an individual aspect for you, Joel, 
and there's a corporate aspect for us as members of Bethany. Individually for you, Joel, and I already alluded to this, I know in, in some sense it probably feels a bit, uh, bit backwards that you're already a member of the church, you have been a member of the church for years, and yet here you are being baptized. And what, what can we say about that except for such is the providence of God? That He often matures us, He teaches us things, He gives us greater understanding and reflection upon where we were, uh, where we were truly at years ago. But Joel, I want to say to you this morning, don't let that take away the significance of what you're doing today. This is a, a new beginning, if you will, of publicly proclaiming your allegiance to Christ. And this time, with a heart truly filled with faith. It's a proclamation of your giving yourself to Christ and to commit yourself to living before Christ and for Christ in the community of His church. But also, there's a, there's a corporate aspect for all of us, Bethany. Baptism is not just a private affair. Baptism is a public judgment, if you will, that the church is making. It is an administration that, God, uh, that Christ has given us as a church, not as an individual, but as a church to bestow upon the individual. And this morning, all of us who have the, bless, uh, the blessing of witnessing Joel walk into the waters of baptism, we are as a church giving our affirmation to our brother that yes, we've seen the evidence of our brother's faith. We've seen the evidence of God's work from heaven being wrought in his heart and therefore we delight and rejoice with him as he publicly identifies with Christ in the waters of baptism. And Christian, to all of us, that's a magnificent thing. It looks ordinary to the person who is not viewing it through the eye of faith. It looks to someone who doesn't believe the gospel like just another pointless religious ritual. But to those who know and cherish and believe the gospel, we understand, no, this is more. This is a foretaste of heaven. This is a glorious occasion of spiritual significance. Of seeing again someone go into these waters which symbolize our union with Christ, our eternal union with Christ, and His redeemed people. Well, before we close, before we close in prayer and prepare our hearts to see our brother baptized, I want to speak to those who are here this morning who are not Christians. Those of you who are perhaps here to see Joel, perhaps you're here for another reason, you just happen to come on a Sunday where we have a baptism, you need to understand that whatever reason you're here, it is not by accident, but rather by God's providence. That as we've considered the subject of baptism, naturally we have considered alongside of it, because they're so closely connected, the glories of the gospel for the sinner. Right? Baptism is a picture of Christ and His Gospel. And what you need to know this morning is that as we speak of the glories of the fact that our God, who created us in His goodness, even though we rebelled against Him and have gone astray, and even though we were unworthy, of Him seeking us, yet in His love, He sent Christ to bring us back. As we speak of these glories, you need to realize that that Gospel, they're not just facts, but it is a genuine, sincere offer that God holds out to you this morning. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Unbeliever, are you a sinner? 
then you qualify to be saved by Christ. You can be the chief of sinners, like the Apostle Paul, and Christ says, come to me that you may have life. Christ graciously commands and invites you to come to him with empty hands, simply the empty hands of faith that have nothing good to give Christ, nothing good to give God, nothing to give by which we think we can twist God's arm to give us heaven in exchange, but rather to come to Christ with empty hands and say, I have nothing to give, but you have I have everything to give. And you have promised that if I apply, I will receive everything from you that I need to be saved. That's the posture of faith that glorifies God. Because you glorify Him as the great benefactor. The one who gives to us everything. Because that's what we are. We're beggars. We are needy beggars who need grace. And grace is found in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So unbeliever, trust Christ this morning. You don't have to do anything publicly to be saved this morning. You don't have to stand up or raise your hand or be baptized. Where you sit in your heart, if you come to Christ, He says, I will in no wise cast you out. And so come to Christ. Come to receive from Him His fullness. Nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to Christ's cross I cling. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for the Gospel this morning. We thank You for Your Son who comes to us clothed in His glorious Gospel. Father, Christ is our all. We are justified because He is our justification. We are sanctified because He is holy. Father, we pray for Your people. Give us more of Christ. Give us greater measures greater knowledge and communion with Christ. We pray that we would give You thanks for the, for the gifts that You have given us, for the knowledge of Christ that You have given us thus far, but that we would also hunger and thirst to see more of Your grace evidenced in our hearts and our lives. Father, we thank You for the ordinance of baptism. We thank You for our brother Joel desiring to obey You, to in faith take You at Your Word. We thank You for the evidence of Your grace in His life and pray that this day it would be a great encouragement to Him, to His family, as well as to us as a church. Father, prepare our hearts now. We thank You for the joys and the glories of Your church of the life of the church, as we see the evidence of Your Spirit, we pray for more and more. Lord, continue to be gracious to us as a church. Continue to build Christ's church in our midst and in the midst of every true church. Be gracious to us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we transition, we're going to sing a hymn while uh, Joel and myself... Uh, get changed if you would turn in your Trinity hymnal to number 731 and can it be number 731 and can it be is that right yeah okay Uh, and let's stand together and sing
here with you, brother. Uh, Joel wants to publicly give praise to God. He's got a brief thing that he's written to give thanks to God and to express why he's wanting and desiring to step into the waters of baptism. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I thought I would be more nervous to be here, uh, but I think I'm, I'm just happy. You know, I, uh, well, anyways, um, yeah, praise God. So I was, I was baptized uh, as a young boy, uh, but I don't remember the state of my heart at the time. Tried very hard to remember. But um, when I remember my life and just what I pursued during that period of time, it just really doesn't align with any kind of a critical, credible profession of faith. So um, today, as one who has committed my life to Christ and is trusting my life to him, I now wish to be faithful and to obey his command to be baptized. I understand that as I go into these waters, I'm trusting that Christ has washed away my sin by his blood, having taken my sin on himself and dying in my place. Jesus proved that God accepted his sacrifice on my behalf by raising him from the dead. And I am grateful to the Lord that he has given us baptism to remind us that I, that we have been born again. And we are now a new creation in Christ. Praise God. Amen. All right, Joel, I'm going to ask you two simple questions. And upon your um, saying, I do, we will baptize you, okay? First of all, Joel, do you profess to repent of your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins, was buried, and raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture? And Joel, do you promise by the help of the Holy Spirit to follow our Lord Jesus Christ forever within the fellowship of his church? Yes. Joel, on the basis of your profession of faith in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's uh, unite our hearts in prayer and close out this day giving thanks to God, and uh, then we'll give the benediction. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful Lord's Day this morning together. We thank you for the foundation of Christ and the wonderful um, truth of the gospel. We thank you for Joel and his faith and his desire to follow in, uh, in following his Savior uh, into the waters of baptism. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to use him, use his life as a bold witness, as a proclamation of these truths. And we pray, Lord, that uh, there would be much fruit bore uh, in him, his family, and in his church family as well. And we praise you, Lord, for this day. We pray that you'd be with us as we continue in fellowship and praise of your, of your good works. And uh, we give this day to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You just please stand real quick for the benediction. We will close our time together. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all the nations according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the glory uh, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ amen amen, amen. you are dismissed <laughs>